Hi everyone, nice to be here. My name is Jonas Eliasson and thanks for having me here. I'm here to talk about the Stockholm congestion charges, but to understand why they are there and why they are needed, I need to say something about urban transportation in general. Cities, they are the, really the foundation of civilization. They are the engines of economic growth and innovation. And economic productivity and quality of life is, generally speaking, higher within large cities with high accessibility than it is outside. And of course then, lots of people and firm, firms want to be in the cities, which means that congestion is really inevitable. It's a problem for all cities around the world, regardless of their size, regardless of the transportation system. So the fact that we have congestion is not meaning that transportation planners do anything in particular wrong, we can do something about it, but congestion in itself is really something that we can't avoid. But this also means uh, uh, that, that uh, the urban land is a very scarce and valuable resource, because that's really what makes uh, the economic engines of cities hum. And that means that in some sense uh, we need some kind of space efficiency when we plan transportation systems uh, in cities. We need to do four things basically, and I'm, today I will only have time to talk about one of them, but it's good to mention all four of them. We need to have attractive, attractive efficient public transportation. We need to make sure that it's possible to walk in the cities. We need to make sure that planning is compact uh, in spatial terms, as, as compact as possible. And we need, in some sense, to restrain car traffic. Uh, and restraining car traffic in as efficient way as possible, that's really what congestion charging is all about. And if you do all of these four things, they really enhance and strengthen each other. In a way you can say that, uh, um, for example, making sure that you have good public transportation means that it hurts less to, to introduce congestion charges. And it also means that congestion charges become, become more efficient than otherwise. So, well, as I said, uh, you need all four of them, but today we'll only talk about restraining car traffic in an efficient manner. In, in an efficient manner, I mean. Now, Stockholm is a medium-sized city with roughly 2 million people, but we really have world-class congestion. And that's because we, have, we are a city built on water with lots of bridges, which means that we have very high congestion levels, despite being not a really, really big city. Uh, and the Stockholm congestion charges, they were introduced uh, first as a trial in 2006, and after a public referendum, they were kept uh, and reintroduced in 2007, and we have them ever since. It's roughly a cordon around the inner city, where it, where it costs two euros, roughly uh, about two US dollars, uh, to cross this cordon in either direction uh, during rush hours. And it costs uh, roughly one euro to cross the cordon in, in, in each direction uh, during off-peak hours, and it's free nights and evenings and, and weekends. Now, this doesn't perhaps sound like much, but it actually gives effect on traffic. Um, Technologically speaking, we talk about toll gantries, so there are no toll plazas, for example. If you pass under this toll gantry, you get an electronic invoice sent directly to your bank account. And there are, there are various technical solutions about this, but it's, it's all about keeping the traffic flowing. It's not about traditional toll plazas, which, of course, use too much space to be efficient when it comes to congestion charging. Um, there are basically two questions of politics and politicians when you come to congestion charges. The first one is, will it work? Will it really reduce congestion? And the other one, okay, even if it works, will they hate me? Will the public hate me? Will I get re-elected or not? And the answer to the first question is, yes, it works. The blue bars here, they show uh, traffic levels in, uh, in, in Stockholm before the congestion charges, and you see two blue bars in the middle, where we, uh, after the referendum, where the congestion charges were abolished again, and then the red bars continue with the congestion charges in place again. And you see that there has been a persistent traffic reduction of roughly 20% of pa passages across the cordon ever since. Now, 20%, it may not seem like, a much, uh, like much, like a very big effect, but 20% reduction of congested peak hour traffic makes a lot of difference to congestion. This is what 20% traffic reduction of congested car traffic looks like. The right picture for you, uh, or was it left? Well, uh, the, uh, uh, the picture with many cars on it anyway, uh, is the day, the last day before the congestion charges. And the, the, the um, the picture with almost no, no, no cars on it uh, is, that, is then the first day with congestion charges in place. And, and you see that it looks like something like 90 or 95 percent of the cars are gone, but it's really only 20 percent of the cars are gone. And the reason is that congestion is such a non-linear phenomenon. If you reduce car traffic by something like 15 or 20 percent, almost all of the congestion will, uh, will actually disappear. 
And not only will, will uh, travel times improve, uh, you, but you will also have gains in travel time reliability, for example. And you can see that the, 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 the small black bars over here, they denote how much travel time variability uh, have been reduced, that, which means that you can be much more certain that you will be in time for important meetings, for example. Now, what happened then to disappearing traffic? Well, roughly half of the disappearing traffic went to public transportation, but perhaps even more interesting is that roughly half of, half of the disappearing car trips went to other things. And we're actually not quite sure where they went. Uh, they might have been, for example, car sharing, perhaps other destinations, maybe other departure times, or some combination here. And I think that one of the key insights is that car traffic, it varies much more from day to day than people generally think of. One, from, for example, b between any two years, for example, roughly 15 to 20 percent of the population in an urban region will change either workplace or, or residential location. Which means that if you introduce something, at first people will get really upset, or at least some people will get really upset, but after a while people will get used to it and will um, adapt to the charges uh, more and more the more time passes on. But this does not mean that the effect wears off. Quite the contrary. Uh, after controlling for population growth and inflation and economic growth and so on, it's actually the case that the effect of the charges in Stockholm has been growing over time, not wearing off. Quite the contrary. Now, the, the other question then. Will people hate the politicians? Well, generally speaking, it's all about surviving the valley of political death. Because once you start to talk about to the public about this general concept, then lots of people will be skeptic. Okay, how will this work? So you will charge me for driving. How am I supposed to adapt about this? And the, the closer you get to the actual implementation, the lower will, generally speaking, be the public support for this. And not until after they have seen the actual benefits will public support start to grow again. Grow again. So it's all about surviving this U-shaped pattern of public support, where you, where, where, where you get less and less support the closer you get to implementation and not until after you have the benefits in place you will, will you get uh, the actual public support for keeping it in place. And this has been the same pattern in basically any city that has tried anything like this. Uh, Stockholm, Gothenburg, Singapore, uh, uh, any other place. Okay, so then why do people change their minds? Well, it's basically because of two reasons. And the first one is, it's better than you thought. You can't really appreciate the time, the, the, this kind of congestion reduction until you've actually seen it and experienced it. Because when you say to, to people, okay, so you will get 20% less traffic, it doesn't sound like a lot. But when you actually experience it, people get much more positive uh, after they've experienced this than, after, than, 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 than before. The other reason is, it's actually not as bad as you thought. Adapting to, 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 to this kind of, of congestion charge is actually not as bad as people think in advance. Uh, it's, it's typically the case that people think that it will be very hard to adapt, it will cost a lot, but if you design the system right, and by designing the system right, I mean designing it in a way that keeps as many trip alternatives open as possible. I mean, after all, you want people to change, right? So you want to give them as many alternatives as possible. That is, other departure times, other destinations, other routes, more public transport options, perhaps bicycle lanes, all kinds of alternatives. And by making sure that you keep many alternatives open, by not overcharging people, uh, that means that they're actually easier to adapt to the charges uh, than people tend to think in, in advance before you introduce it. Another interesting study was done where we asked people both before and after the introduction how much they thought that they would change. So we asked how much less do you drive now with the charges in place, now do you drive now across the cordon compared to before the charges. And the self-reported change when you ask people was somewhere between 5 and 10%. But the actual figure of change of people's driving patterns was actually that the, uh, the, 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 uh, was actually around 30%. So around three quarters of the disappearing car trips were actually not missed or not perceived by the car drivers themselves. And I think that the reason behind this is that there are so many, let's call them occasional car drivers out there. There are some habitual car drivers and some people who never drive a car. But the vast majority of car drivers are actually people who drive, well, a couple of times each week, especially in the, in, in, in the inner city. And that's why it's so important to make sure that the people that you affect is really these occasional car drivers, because they will reduce their car driving from 
perhaps, I don't know, two or three trips per week, maybe one trip per week, to something that might be, well, 20 or 25% less, which is something that many of them will not even notice. So, to achieve public and political support, you need to do a couple of things. You need to make sure that the system delivers tangible benefits, that it actually reduces congestion. And designing congestion pricing systems is actually a rather difficult thing to do. You need a good transport model and you need traffic experts, which to be honest means that it's not politicians that should design the system. It should be traffic experts which act who actually sits there designing things with a detailed knowledge about the particular transportation system, system in that particular city because it's a hard job and you need to be sure that you deliver tangible benefits. The other thing is it needs to be part of a strategy. You need to present to people that we, we don't do this just to harm you, to, to make life difficult for you. We do this to make it better, a more efficient, public, a more efficient transportation system in, in general. Um, you need to make sure that you have a design which is consistent with your stated purpose. Which means that if you say that this is about congestion reduction, you need to make sure that it actually reduces congestion. Which Sounds like an obvious thing to say, but for example, you can't have as a target to generate lots of revenues, for example, because that's another thing. And people will see through this. If you design the system in a way that, reduce, that maximizes revenue rather than maximizes congestion reduction, you can't, lose the pu you can't win the public acceptability battle. You need to make sure that you align the political credit, blame and responsibility. It's often the case that city politicians are worried about what this does to this complicated negotiation game between the city level, the regional level, the national level, or perhaps the state level or something else like this. Because if you suddenly have a revenue stream from congestion pricing, this does something to the negotiations that always goes on because, between all of these geographical levels of government. And for good reasons, the city politicians might actually be worried that this revenue stream that suddenly comes to them might mean that they suddenly get less money from the state or from the national government. And if you, and, and this is actually a worry to take, to take in, into consideration. This is seldom a problem for the public acceptability, but for politicians' acceptability, the, let's call it the, 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 the institutional context, the political institutional context is actually a key thing to solve. You also need to make sure um, that, that, you, that you are basically honest. Uh, that, that means that you admit that some things are uncertain. It might help to have this as a trial because that means that you can say things like, okay, we think that this will work, but if it doesn't work, we, 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 we are actually going to change things, maybe abolish it altogether or at least redesign it. So being honest about all the uncertainties there are and not painting too rosy a picture is actually a very good thing. Thank you so much.